Please be seated. Mr. Mayor, I believe um, we had just had the uh, item five moved and seconded, and you were about to ask if there are any other speakers and then take a vote. Any more speakers? Is that agreed? Thank you. Order six, Councillor Richard Mills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I'd like to move suspension of Council Procedure Rule 14.4 in relation to speaking time. This is to enable the mover and seconder of the motion and the principal speaker and seconder of any amendment unlimited speaking time for this item. Thank you. Is that a second by Councillor Davis? I second it. Thank you. Is that agreed? Thank you. Next item, Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Once again, like all local authorities throughout the country, we're confronted by challenges in formulating a budget which enables us to meet our legal obligations, maintain our existing high quality of services to residents, whilst at the same time continuing to live within the reality of a constrained funding envelope. We must recognise that worldwide and domestic crises have conspired to fundamentally change the British economy and hence the resources which central government has at its disposal. And these are not factors which are unique to the UK. Similar pressures exist across continental Europe and in some instances to an even greater extent than here. For the past three years, we have sustained the impact of the COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine on our national resources and our economy. Today, we must add to that the conflict in the Middle East, which inevitably is driving up consumer costs and public spending. Mr. Mayor, the inescapable conclusion, therefore, is that there has been a fundamental change in the extent and the availability of public sector finances, and that we all, as members and citizens, have to take account of this in the way in which we live our lives, manage our finances, and indeed, our expectations. A recognition of this seismic shift in the state of public sector finances and the need to introduce changes to the way in which we deliver our services whilst retaining their scope and integrity is fundamental to this administration's medium-term strategy and hence will characterise not only this budget but also those which will follow in future years. In this context, it is important that we all in this borough, members and residents alike, adhere to the principle of preservation of our services, but that we recognise the need for changes to their mode of delivery, such that this will yield efficiencies and ultimately cost savings. It's gratifying to report that the last 12 months has witnessed a reduction in inflation. This has been driven, I would suggest, by two key factors. Firstly, the fall in worldwide energy prices, and secondly, by the actions of the Bank of England in increasing interest rates which has served to suppress consumer demand. A current inflation rate of 4% still prevails, and whilst this represents major progress from the 11.1% rate reported in October 2022, there are perhaps signs that further reactive reductions may take time and may be harder to achieve, particularly in the light of the restricted access to the Red Sea for cargo shipping and the current trend of pay and wage settlements exceeding the underlying growth in core consumer prices. We should not lose sight of the fact that the current inflation rate of 4% remains at double the Bank of England target rate. Mr. Mayor, whilst inflation rates may have fallen, costs that we all sustain, with the exception of commodities, do not. Indeed, key areas such as staff pay settlements and outsourced social care cost increases tend to emerge some time after the publication of inflation statistics and therefore are likely to exceed the current prevailing rate. With effect from the 1st of April 2022, central government funding for COVID-19 ceased. Yet, the legacy for COVID continues to this very day in terms of escalating social care demands and reduced council income 
as our residents adjust their working and living practices. We therefore expect that many aspects of the COVID legacy will become permanently embedded in our operating model. Social care consumes a huge proportion of every local authority's budgets. And indeed, it currently represents a considerable 66% of Hillingdon's total service expenditure. Independent of the influence of COVID, the demand for these services has continued to increase. And indeed, the per client cost of residential care has escalated relentlessly and spectacularly. Cost of living pressures have had the, an adverse impact upon families and businesses alike, with the inevitable direct impact on social care needs and pressures on council tax and business rate support and indeed realisations. During the year, interest rates have con continued to rise in order to manage down inflation. A year ago, the Bank of England rate stood at 4%. Today, it stands at 5.25%, with expert forecasters suggesting that reductions will have to wait until further tangible and sustained evidence for inflation reductions is at hand. These factors have conspired to maintain pressure on local authority finances, particularly and most significantly as central government grant funding has been and will continue to run flat whilst cost budgets escalate. It is notable that last week's announcement by the Office for National Statistics that the UK is now officially in recession will come as no great surprise to most of us. The effects and the symptoms were already there, but confirmation of the news may well serve to dampen confidence further throughout the economy. As we are all aware, political instability around the world is creating increasing asylum demand, and Hillingdon is particularly exposed in this respect as Heathrow is a port of entry. Indeed, Hillingdon has had to absorb 653 requests for asylum in the current financial year. And this represents a huge increase from the 136 sought in the last 22-23 financial year. The assimilation of asylum seekers imposes cost pressure on housing, education, health and social care and is not adequately mitigated by grant funding. The final local government settlement for 24-25 has now been received. And the good news is that this has allowed us to refine and increase the estimates for grant funding, which were reflected in the consultation budget, which was released in December last. However, the final settlement gave us no greater clarity in terms of the number of key areas of funding for 25-26 and later years. And I will return to this subject later. We have preserved, supported and invested in our frontline services and we will continue to do so. We recognise the significance of these services and their importance to our residents. Hence, there have not been and there will not be any cuts to key frontline services. Indeed, our philosophy is that we will provide whatever it takes in resources to ensure that high quality service is delivered, albeit that we may seek to deliver them in the most effective and cost efficient way. Mr Mayor, we understand the domestic cost of living pressures that our residents all face and have sought to minimise further costs. You will hear from me later about the excellent value which Hillingdon's council tax and fees and charges represent. But nevertheless, we must accept the reality that some cost escalation is unavoidable. We will always tell it how it is in a direct, open and transparent dialogue with our residents and will not shy away from difficult but necessary decisions. Against this environment of escalating costs and limited growth in income, it is clear that we must maintain our policy of balancing budgets by the use of a sustained and strategic savings programme. This programme is designed to promote long-term financial stability and is built using the following key principles. Firstly, creating efficiencies in the way in which we deliver services whilst driving down internal administration costs. Maximising and making use of the best possible options in terms of grant funding. Investing and developing modern digital technology which will drive efficiency, be accessible to our residents and promote high quality business intelligence using enhanced data. Achieving the best use of our assets and ensuring that we deliver strong positive returns wherever possible. We are looking to introduce a policy which will seek to ensure 
that we optimize the use of assets deployed in providing frontline services, while also maximizing the financial return from investment assets. Only assets which do not satisfy these conditions will be considered for disposal. So let's get away from this ridiculous misconception that we might be selling the family silver. If an asset isn't giving us a satisfactory return, either in terms of its contribution to service delivery or by way of investment return, it must be a candidate for disposal and the best realisation available will be sought. Next, the introduction of management techniques from the commercial world, such as zero-based budgeting. ZBB has been used here in the past, but only to a limited extent and in isolated instances. What is unique about the current exercise is that it covers the entire authority. It is enabling us to redefine priorities, challenge existing procedures and cost structures, and to optimize operating structures. ZBB will deliver a long-term and valuable legacy for this authority, which we will refresh at regular intervals. But I must emphasize, the vast majority of benefits from this program are not yet reflected here, but they will become apparent over a number of years in the future. Next, invest to save. Hillingdon has a strong balance sheet, and hence the capacity to invest in its infrastructure. Doing so can and will drive down costs. This five-year forecast includes invest-to-save capital spending amounting to £80.7 million within the general fund. And this will yield revenue savings of £8.7 million per annum. Included within this are investments to expand residential care capacity, carbon zero initiatives, and digital technology, just to name a few. We will continue to maintain strong financial controls, and these will be enhanced by the introduction of a new financial system, Oracle Cloud, in 24-25. Managing cash flow and borrowing levels, and I will return to this subject later. Mr. Mayor, this programme will yield 33.4 million in savings during the term of the MTFF. I must emphasise that all savings measures contained within the MTFF have been fully assessed and evaluated. They are highly specific, and hence I share with our senior officers a confidence that they will be delivered. I also believe that in the years ahead, we will continue to generate further savings, which will maintain balanced budgets and enhance our resilience by strengthening our reserves in what will continue to be a difficult and challenging economic environment ahead. Mr Mayor, we prepared and submitted a consultation budget in December 2023. Residents and the Council Select Committees have received the opportunity to consider and comment on this. The results of this consultation indicate overall positive support for our proposals. And indeed, even a number of the points of criticism made are directly addressed in our proposals. We have made relatively few changes to the consultation budget. Our members can see a table which fully summarises these on Table 1, page 6 of last week's Cabinet paper. The key changes are that for 24-25, the finalised local government settlement yields an additional £974,000, while £750,000 of additional business rates income has been identified from the excellent work carried out by our award-winning counter-fraud team. The increased income has been used to absorb projected increases in spending identified from further demand for homelessness, looked after children and adult social care services. Due to our strong balance sheet, we have been able to increase general fund capital investment by £30 million. And this has been allocated to in-borough special education needs provision, highways, digital technology and adult residential care. An impressive further £108 million of capital expenditure has also been added to the housing revenue account in order to stimulate growth in housing supply. In summary, this brings us to a position whereby we can propose a budget which once again is fully balanced for next year. 
with a slightly increased cumulative budget gap of £18.5 million, an increase of £953,000 for the years 25-26 to 28-29. Mr Mayor, it should be noted that officers estimate that £5.1 million per annum of the budget gap in later years can be attributed to uncertainty as to whether government grant levels in the last four years of the MTFF where quite rightly a prudent and arguably pessimistic position has been taken by us in excluding this from future funding levels. Turning to our service expenditure forecast projections in the MTFF, we will experience an increase in annual costs from £263 million in the current financial year to £321 million by 2028 29 That is an increase of £58 million after, and I emphasise that, after, we have realised the benefit of our £33 million savings programme, which I've already described. So to be absolutely clear about it, if we had not initiated the savings programme, our costs would have escalated by £91 million. Inevitably, the largest single factor in this cost growth is inflation. This is projected to amount to £48 million across the five-year term of the MTFF, with £20 more million pounds worth of increases falling within the first two years of the forecast period. Of these increases, £20 million is in respect of anticipated pay settlements, while £17 million is in respect of social care costs, and a further £8 million is expected to be derived from the renegotiation of outsourced contracts. Whilst the Bank of England projects that inflation will fall back from the current 4% to 2% by the end of the current 2024 calendar year, we have retained higher rates of inflation within our forecast at a composite 9.3% in the first two years. Firstly, because staff pay settlements are agreed retrospectively, and secondly, because a number of the authorities' outsourced contracts remain to be renegotiated. Furthermore, it is my view that we should remain cautious with regard to the bank's forecast, and hence we may find that higher levels of inflation remain with us for longer. The growing demand for council services is also a factor, with this adding £28 million to our costs by 2028-29. Adult social care placements, support for looked after children, support for children with disabilities, and SEND transport collectively accounts for £19 million of this increase. Whilst a third of £3.6 million is derived from growth in, in demand for waste disposal, and a further £3.6 million is attributable to the increase in provision for homelessness. Within our financing and corporate budgets, the largest influence for change is in respect of debt service costs, which are projected to increase as a result of the progressive upward adjustments in interest rates, recently made by the Bank's Monetary Policy Committee, and the changes in level of debt required to finance part of our capital programmes. This generates an increase in debt service costs of £8.1 million by 2829. Once again, we have been pessimistic in our view as to when we might expect interest rates to fall. However, I must emphasise that we are sheltered from the very worst impacts of interest rate rises by our long-term borrowing strategy, which I will comment on further later on. Concessionary fares on TfL services, which are recharged to us by the GLA, are forecast to continue to return to pre-pandemic levels, thus adding £4.9 million worth of costs by 28-29. Whilst our costs will see a major increase across the life of the MTFF, it is clear that the only income source which we can count on to provide us with sustained growth is council tax. This is projected to grow by £35 million across the term of the MTFF, with £27 million being derived from increases in the prevailing rate and the balance of £8 million being derived from an expected growth in our population of taxpayers. Business rates will increase in 24-25 as a result of the reappraisal carried out by the Valuations Office in 22-23. Last year, we were cautious about taking account of this because of the potential for valuation appeals and because of potential declining collectability given the difficult economic environment. However, those worst fears have not been realised and therefore we have been able to reflect an increase in income attributable to us of £8.4 million. I must emphasise that Hillingdon is only entitled to retain 
15% of the total business rates earned within this borough, the balance being absorbed by central government and the Greater London Authority. I must also point out that our forecasts do not anticipate any further increases in business rates income across the last four years of the MTFF. As I've already mentioned, the trajectory for central government grant funding over the next five years is flat. Mr Mayor, the government has given a clear indication to councils that council tax should be used to the maximum extent possible to finance escalation in costs. And accordingly, the referendum limit is set at 5%, being 3% in respect of core council tax and a further 2% for the adult social care precept. In my opinion, the 5% referendum limit is likely to be retained by gov central government for this foreseeable future. In common with many councils in England, Hillingdon therefore proposes to set its core council tax at an increase of 2.99%, with the social care precept being set at 2%. This will have an impact of increasing Hillingdon's council tax on a band D equivalent home to £1,392.21, or an increase of £1.27 a week. <coughs> I should also add that the average increase across England for the equivalent bandy properties has been calculated to be £2 per week. Mr Mayor, Hillingdon charges the second lowest level of council tax in outer London, with only Newham setting a lower charge. If we consider the current proposals after adding in the London Mayor of Precept, and more of that a bit later. The total 24-25 years council tax bill for a resident in Hillingdon with a band D property will be £1,863.91, whilst the equivalent cost in labour control Brent, sorry, in Barnet, is £1,943.24. In labour controlled Ealing, it is £1,948.34. In labour controlled Hounslow, £1,991.01. In labour control Brent, £2,036.95. And in Harrow, which recently passed into Conservative hands and where the battle continues to re remedy the legacy, it is £2,286.32. So to be clear, a band D council taxpayer in Hillingdon will be £422.41 a year, or 18.5%, better off than a Harrow resident. And that is even before we consider the comparative impact of fees and charges. Consolidated within the annual, annual council tax cost that I've referred to is the London mayoral precept, which is a levy on all London borough residents. The 24-25 Mayor Khan's proposed precept will amount to £471.40 and hence represents 25.3% of a Hillingdon Bandy residence total bill. The London Mayor has increased the precept this year by 8.6%, and this follows hard on the heels of the 9.7% increase Shameful. which he opposed for 23-24. Indeed, the eight annual budgets which Mr Khan has presided over have seen the precept increase by an extraordinary 70.8%. Let me repeat Shameful. that, 70.8%. Not content with fleecing our poorer and older residents with the £12.50 a day ULES charges, Mr Khan has once again announced his intention to hammer residents with an increased preset. Clearly, this is driven by the futile attempt to feed the gaping financial black hole, otherwise known as Transport for London, as well as wasting money on expensive media campaigns and pointless renaming of London Overground yeah, Lines. Yeah whilst at the same time it would seem tucking money away as some sort of pre-election handout that we will doubtless learn about in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Mayor, this sends a clear message as to what life might be like under a Labour administration. Spending profligacy, gross financial mismanagement and eye-watering tax increases. Yeah. 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 Let us stay with the subject of financial mismanagement for a moment longer. An unprecedented number of seven councils in England have filed for bankruptcy under Section 114 of the Local Government Act in the last two years. Furthermore, a survey of council leaders conducted by a national newspaper has suggested that one in five, one in five in England 
foresee the possibility of them following suit into bankruptcy in the next two years. It is clear that a combination of excess debt and an inability to balance their budgets has caused this situation. And I suggest that a failure to confront and adopt radical change in response to cost pressures is a major contributory factor to such a sorry state of affairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Mayor, the Labour Party opposite take great delight in trying to persuade anyone who will listen that Hillingdon too is on the brink of bankruptcy. They tried to tell the electorate that this was about to happen during the 2022 local election campaign, but it hasn't happened. Yeah. And Mr Mayor, it will not happen yeah. under this Conservative administration. How can I be so confident about this assertion? Firstly, our levels of debt are low. A survey of general fund debt levels across the UK was conducted by the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities as at September 2023. What it showed was that collectively, local authorities in the UK had borrowings totaling £133 billion. Pounds, billion pounds. The authorities ranked 1st to 20th in order of size of liability, all reported debts in excess of £1 billion. Pounds. By contrast, Hillingdon was 137th on that list, with £283 million pounds worth of debt at that time. <coughs> and I can add that all our immediate neighbouring boroughs had at least double, some close to treble, that amount. And that furthermore, Hillingdon sits very comfortably inside its borrowing limits and covenants, such that it has the capacity to invest when appropriate. Yeah. Secondly, Hillingdon will not spend money that it does not have. Yeah. We will continue to drive out costs through efficiency programmes such that we can deliver what our residents expect of us. Many councils try to use reserves in order to o absorb overspends rather than tackling the root cause of the overspend. It has been suggested that Hillingdon's reserves are comparatively low, and I would not disagree with that assertion. But this budget is taking steps to address this. However, there are reasons why our reserves are low. Over a period of 10 years, up to 2018-19, this Conservative administration operated a freeze in council tax rates, whilst at the same time preserving, and in many instances enhancing, frontline services. A conscious decision was made to provide excellent value to residents rather than to build up large reserves. Yeah, yeah. Mr Mayor, this is a fundamental policy question as to how an authority uses council taxpayers' money. Today, that council tax freeze is worth a saving of £5,779.60 to a resident and bandy council taxpayer who lived in Hillingdon throughout that 10-year period and continues to live here today. Over the period from April 2008 until December 2023, the Consumer Price Index, which is the generally accepted measure of inflation, has increased by 59%. Over the same period, the population of this borough has increased from 262,500 to 310,000, and that is an increase of 18%. By contrast, under Hillington Conservatives, Council tax has increased by an overall 24% over this same 15-year period. Mr Mayor, here is the evidence of the great value that Hellingham Conservatives are providing to residents. Yeah, yeah. But let me remind you once again of the London Mayor's increase, 70.8% over the last eight years. Furthermore, the introduction of the CT Older Persons Discount has yielded a saving for a Band D householder of £6,997.25 for any resident over the age of 25 who has participated in the scheme since its inception. If ever you were looking for evidence of our great support for our older residents, here it is. As a borough, our fees and charges are amongst the very lowest per capita in London. In fact, there are only two authorities in amongst the 33 London boroughs who have lower fees per capita than Hillingdon. Our policy is that fees and charges should not be profit-making, but simply should cover the costs of service delivery. Having made an adjustment to rectify a number of legacy loss-making services last year, this year fees and charges are being adjusted by the prevailing rate of inflation only, 
and this will be the policy that we will follow in the future. The significance of a stable financial position and strong management is that it enables the Council to invest in frontline services and infrastructure with confidence. A confidence that, that the consequences of its actions and its decisions are beneficial to our residents, are measurable and understandable in terms of their impact on our financial position. This approach has yielded success in the way in which we deliver our services to our residents. In spite of the challenging financial environment in the last year, Hillingdon has generated many improvements in services, including leisure centre improvements at Highgrove and Hillingdon, playground refurbishments at Fashionips Park, Albion Road Hayes and Peters Road Cowley, and shortly to be completed, Ricelip Lider. Tennis court improvements at Northwood, Rosedale and Harmonsworth. New housing at Acorn Place, Cowley and Nelson Road, Hillingdon. Town centre improvements at Sutton Court Road and Mulberry Parade, West Drayton. Pay by phone parking. Oh yes, and furthermore, our children's and education services received an outstanding rating from Ofsted this year. These achievements are of course derived from the excellent work of our officer teams. However, they could not have happened without the support and resource provided to them by this Conservative administration. <coughs> Mr Mayor, we will hear shortly from a number of Cabinet member colleagues who will share some of the further initiatives built into the 24-25 budget. This administration believes that council tax received from our residents should be used for two purposes only. Firstly, to cover the necessary costs of providing and investing in excellent frontline services and infrastructure, and secondly, ensuring that the Council has adequate but not excessive balances and reserves to meet any unforeseen costs and obligations which may arise from outside and uncontrollable factors. Hillingdon carries a level of balances which are assessed <coughs> professionally as being appropriate to and consistent with our economic environment and identified risk profiles. At the end of 23-24, in just over a month's time, Hillingdon will hold £37 million in balances. This, of course, is after we have absorbed the pressures of 23-24. This represents a stable programme for our activities and our risk environment as assessed. Our Corporate Director of Finance has determined that the recommended range for unallocated reserves within the authority should be between 32 million and 55 million. This medium-term financial forecast makes provision for an increase of 7.5 million pounds in reserves, and this underpins that position. This approach illustrates the prudence and care which characterises all Hillingdon's financial decisions. And as a matter of policy, we will therefore continue to set future balance budgets without resorting to and drawing down general balances. Indeed, it is our policy to build them further in order to increase our strength and resilience. The strength of our balance sheet enables us to refresh and maintain investment within our infrastructure, our leisure facilities and our schools through the General Fund Capital Programme. And we are committed to expenditure of £248 million over the term of the MTFF. Major features within this programme include the following. £37 million on the Usley and West Drayton Leisure Centre. £26 million on the replacement of the HOAC Sports and Leisure Facility. £20 million on Carbon Zero Initiatives. £20 million on the Civic Centre Transformation. £25 million in Working Capital Funding for Hillingdon First Limited to finance pipeline construction projects. £10.5 million for the provision of adult residential care. £48 million on school buildings. £43 million on the borough's roads and pavements. This represents a firm commitment to maintaining the environment which Hillingdon residents enjoy and will be achieved with incremental borrowing of only £63 million, which will take the general fund uh, to a peak position in debt of, 25, of £279 million by 25-26. This is comfortably within our borrowing limits and are entirely affordable in terms of debt service obligations. I must also add that our overall effective interest rate on our borrowings currently stands at 3.7%. That is below the current Bank of England base rate of 5.2%, 5.25%, I beg your pardon, and is a reflection of our careful and well-informed long-term planning, which has been achieved by locking in favourable long-term interest rates. Mr Mayor, I now turn to the Housing Revenue Account. The Housing Revenue Account is a ring-fenced fund that currently comprises an estate of 10,258 council houses. The HRA has a stable capital platform with reserves of 15.1 million 
and an operating position which is on budget for the current financial year. The revenue budget for 24-25 will see rents increase by 7.7%, being an increase of the consumer price index plus 1%, that representing the statutory ceiling. This generates an income to rent, revenue income, rental income, I'm sorry, in 24-25 of £6.8 million in monetary terms, whilst our costs are forecast to increase by £7.3 million, the largest factors being payroll costs of £5.6 million and repairs and planned maintenance of £2.7 million. Across the life of the MTFF, inflation is projected to increase costs by £8.5 million. The revenue account budget for 24-25 yields a balanced budget after a contribution of £22.4 million towards our capital programme. Over the MTFF period to 28-29, the housing revenue account capital programme comprises a spend of £550 million. This programme will see a, the creation of 922 new homes and an investment of £177 million in the improvement of existing housing stock. Over the period of the MTFF, HRA ring fence borrowings to finance the programme will increase by £174 million, with a peak level of debt sitting at £467 million in 2829. This again stays within debt covenants and limits, and our debt service costs are, are comfortably assimilated. Mr. Mayor, as I've already stated, this budget contains no service costs, cuts. And notwithstanding the bumps in the road that inevitably will lie ahead, we are absolutely committed to maintaining and indeed enhancing the comprehensiveness and the quality of our frontline services. We have reached this highly satisfactory budgetary position today through an approach of vigilance, expertise and early responsiveness. We will continue to monitor trends in economics and demographics closely. We will be insisted in that pro process over time by our investment in digital technology. We will respond to the challenges that arise and we will not shy away from difficult decisions. This budget preserves the manifesto promises made by Hillingdon Conservatives. We recognise that the current cost of living pressures are challenging for everyone but we are realists and it's inevitable that we all as residents have to share in that increased burden. However, it should be of comfort to us that here in Hillingdon, the cost of council tax and fees and charges are amongst the very lowest in outer London and that is a position that we will maintain. Mr Mayor, this is a strong and sound budget for this authority and our residents. It is careful and prudent in its approach to the risks that it faces, but it is forward-looking and dynamic when making the right decisions and provision for our residents. We will continue to invest in the infrastructure of this borough and its frontline services, and we do so with confidence. In closing, Mr Mayor, I want to recognise that this budget has been a considerable collaborative effort by our excellent team of officers. I wish to thank Tony Zayman and all of the corporate management team for their engagement and support. This budget also relies heavily upon the expertise of the Finance Directorate. And I wish to thank our Section 151 Officer Andy Evans, Ian Waters, Matthew Kelly, Alex Brown and Andy Goodwin and their teams, all of whom have worked long and hard to great effect on this endeavour. Mr Mayor, I therefore move recommendations 1 to 16 as set out in Section 6 of this evening's Order of Business. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Goodo. Is that seconded by Councillor Edwards? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I second and reserve my rights, please. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Mathers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I move this carefully costed and balanced Labour amendment to the Conservatives' proposed budget, which will be needed this year more than ever as we begin to clear up Conservatives' desperate and costly financial mess. This Conservative administration is proposing a budget of hasty decisions solely focused on short-termism and evading problems at hand. This proposed budget is not fit for purpose and needs this amendment. The Cabinet needs to go back and reconsider. 
If unamended, the consequences of this budget over the next five years' time will result in an £18 million funding gap, declining housing stock, £75 million less community assets, increased capital borrowing, and this amendment can help towards amending these things, but particularly, which is of great concern, the lack of general balances, the lack of our reserves, currently 26 million, well out of the safe range of 32 to 55 million. These conservative budget proposals actually need amending as they ultimately lead us down a pathway to bankruptcy. In contrast to this conservative proposed budget, this Labour amendment would build council reserves in the short and medium term. It would reduce the DSG deficit, reduce the pressure on social care, childcare places, as well as ensure that streets are kept clean. It would support households in a cost of living crisis. It would improve and support public health initiatives. It would improve the housing across the rental sector. Hillings and Labour will and would bring in investment and invest in services, cut back on conservative excesses build more council homes and not break our promises. We will keep free weekly waste collections of all types of waste. Before I outline why my budget amendment is so important and the one of the Labour group, I firstly want to thank council officers, the finance officers who have worked me and my Labour colleagues who have costed out carefully this amendment. We really appreciate their support. And a personal thank you to those officers in the group offices and democratic services for their continued support. As elected members, Lord, we are as strong as the officers around us and we thank them. And as a council, we are extremely uh, fortunate to have dedicated officers. Mr Mayor, this amendment is financially responsible. It invests in income generation across the council's messy financial landscape. This council is historically known for underbidding for funding, and I can see that it is frustrating that instead of fair funding formulas for local authority, that ultimately this bankrupt Conservative government makes councils waste resources bidding for crumbs around the table. And for the time-limited period they are in power, we must work with them. So within this amendment, we propose bid writing team, one that will not only pay for itself, but will contribute to building towards some of the 18 million funding gap in this budget proposal. Further to this, the team will help reduce out of control spending in the school's budget. This will be done by bidding on behalf of parents' pupil premium and could reduce the deficit by up to half a million pounds at very little cost. Politics aside, if the Conservatives vote down this thoughtful and pragmatic amendment tonight, I urge this administration at least to adopt this approach. It worked in Labour run Lewisham and it ensures the educational needs of our children is of the utmost importance. On the theme of income generation, for successive years, Hillens and Labour has stated that the Battle of Britain bunker should be put in trust to preserve it, to expand it, to expand its offer to our residents. And this could have saved the council millions. They talk about quick action, but we have not seen it. Our amendment costs out 1.26 million of income generation throughout this period that cannot be sniffed at by moving our heritage sites to a charitable trust. This would save the council money, but generate more opportunities for the sites and secures our heritage sites as this council does everything it can to sell off assets to the highest bidder and looks like it's getting rid of historic buildings such as Barrow Hall. I can see the administration's faces. They may be looking away. They may not be interested in investing in these small income generating schemes because of their track record maybe. They have failed to income generate, except where it comes to increasing fees. Let me give an example of their lack of business sense. In the historic Middlesex suite, they only managed to generate £1,100 last year. No business sense, no ambition. To provide further savings, our amendment, Mr Mayor, would cut back on the communications budget. It's often used to champion the administration, and unlike killing Conservatives, who rely on spinning, the narrative of Hillings and Labour remains clear and to the point. So let me be clear, Hillings and Labour does not break its pledges to our residents. Unlike the Conservatives opposite, we will keep free weekly waste collections of all types of waste. And that is why we're reversing the cuts to garden waste in this amendment. And it's not all. We'll invest in residents, in our streets, in our children and in public health. 
As this amendment shows, we'll ensure that streets are kept clean by increasing the number of clean operatives by four, reversing part of the cut of 11 street patrols in this budget. Sweeping machines are helpful and we do need to brace um, technology. However, the coverage of street cleaning is getting increasingly thin and machines cannot take rubbish out of bushes or walk through places, so we rely on the good staff that we employ to maintain the cleanliness and pride in our borough streets. This does demonstrate, Mr Mayor, a cut to services, but we will reverse it in part. In this Liz Trust, Rishi Sunak, whoever the Prime Minister may be, cost of living cause crisis. Families have had to turn to the Council for support, and as the government hide their mistakes, they have provided a fund, household support fund. This comes to an end on the 31st of March this year, and I haven't heard our Conservative administration lobbying their government, including colleagues in the room, to maintain this lifeline for residents. This amendment provides a modest amount, and it is modest, to continue the support we have proposed 110,000 to set aside to support households facing financial difficulty, with things such as purchasing rice goods or uniforms to offset the impact of the fund clo closing. Further to this, our local residents will be supported through cost of living crisis by following the introduction of the first permit fee, freezing the uplift to this charge at a minor cost to the council of 5,000. We need to stop and freeze this permit charge now before in a few years it becomes another £100 fee. Residents are angry and we must listen to their voices. This amendment invests in public health by making Council Tennis Court 3 still using the online booking system. This should resolve the problem with private usage and others that we had spoken about in the past with this. At private is intuition. This will be made in part on, by making part of one site have a commercial corporate tennis offer using a capital investment of 250,000 required to build a clubhouse, a cafe and shop. This will break even within the first year and has been successful in the London Borough of Ealing. In future years, this investment will further support increased activities and offers for, in school holidays for children or maybe invest back into our bowls clubs. Alongside to invest in our communities and our health, this amendment will reduce the risk within the transformation programme by building up a contingency for digital disaster with earmarked reserves. We would hope not to use this, but with their poor short-term decision-making that we've seen in the Cabinet, the Council is likely to be pushed to use this in the last two remaining years of their administration. Mr Mayor, let's talk about housing and how good affordable housing can not just help people have quality lives but also save money from the Council, preventing cuts in the future. This amendment shows how more Council houses can be built in an affordable way. The HRA amendment increases the housing stock to a net 100 homes in two years, effectively increasing the stock to compensate for the poor right to buy sales. This circa £35 million investment will yield additional rent of one, over £1 million per annum at the end of the five year cycle. These new homes will only be brought in as interest rates drop to have responsible borrowing. To balance the HRA, a bid review will be carried out on both tenancy management and repairs, ensuring efficiency gains from upfront investment in repairs are maximised, securing an additional 382,000 savings. This is very much achievable, as this represents less than 1% of these two services. The Council's budget cannot be reviewed in isolation, as this increased investment in the HRA will help the Council secure an additional 150,000 per annum benefit from 2026-27 by reducing the pressure on looked after children's budgets, effectively having an offer of housing for those who are 18 year olds trapped in expensive supervised settings. I would love to have been this amendment to have gone further with the house, council house building program. However, as a result of inaction and poor decision making from the cabinet, they exhausted the HRA's ability to make repayments by buying properties and not building properties. This amendment does not abandon a Hillingdon building policy. The amendment corrects this cabinet who have banned a more affordable approach to house building in, in favour of their more expensive house buying. Their hasty decision caused by a poor housing policy uh, coming to fruition. The HRA can no longer afford to repay the house building needed. So I just ask them how they're going to manage this in the future and how did they get it so badly wrong? Continuing the theme of housing, this amendment improves housing costs in the rental sector in Hillingdon, raising standards of landlords 
and us as a landlord with our 10,000 households housing stock, we should set the example. By investing in our housing stock and doubling the repairs growth in the budget proposals over the three year period, this amendment will accelerate the work required to improve council housing stock and avoid disrepair claims. This ensures the council is caring and a quality landlord. We cannot be the gatekeeper of the proposed within this amendment landlord licensing schemes if we ourselves do not reach those standards. This amendment brings us up to the investment levels required to catch up on repairs and save the public purse from a growing number of disrepair claims that the Services Administration are receiving. The Labour Group has proposed a landlord licence scheme and employing a HMO monitoring officer for multiple years. Other <coughs> London boroughs have done this and improved standards in the rental sector. So we have to ask, why hasn't Hillingdon? It is achievable and it is possible and it is affordable. This amendment contains proposals for supporting physical and mental wellbeing and the housing one particularly will help to reduce the impact of HMOs on their neighbours and the costs on the council. Taking action in these areas will further contribute to the council's savings through early intervention. It's a win-win. Now, Mr Mayor, finally, but most importantly, our reserves. As confirmed within the budget papers, our reserves are the lowest levels when compared to nearest neighbours and London boroughs, making them ranked by CIFA as higher risk authority. That wasn't mentioned and should have been. Being a higher risk authority is a concerning thing. And for the first time in living memory, our general balances are well below the accepted ranges by a long way. With the administration spending 50% of its earmarked reserves every year, it leaves us in a financial mess and it puts us at risk. No wonder GB Renews is reporting on it. This Labour amendment begins to build up the reserves. The Conservative budget does not cost out how they will achieve their annual 1.5 million top-up reserves after this year. Can it really be achieved? The Labour Amendment banks increase in general reserves. The Cabinet must consider this and their proposals and do the same. Mr Mayor, this amendment curtails Conservatives' excess, as many the Labour amendments have. Does anybody remember the £40 million theatre that was going to put the other theatres out of business? Well, within this amendment, we are looking to be prudent. In the, in the panicked financial times, the National and Local Conservatives have created they are very reluctant to curb back on their own excesses. This budget amendment will take from earmarked reserves from member-led expenses, oh, sorry, uh, costs, and put 500,000 back into general balances. The reserves will be banked in general balances. That's where reserves should be. They should be banked, not potentially allocated for other disasters and other things that are ahead. Those reserves are surplus. We need to concentrate on the baseline, which is well out of range. It is worth noting that the extra 3,000 in this amendment that is outstanding can go to general balances also, but it's just slightly higher than the underspend this year the Conservatives have managed. The Conservatives' reverb policy is alarming. When nearly a quarter of this year's saving requirements is at risk, there is a serious problem of delivery. If Canadian Conservatives continue to go down this path in the next five years, the gap will get greater and greater. But Labour's careful and strategic amendment has increased general reserves over this period by two million, fully costed, unlike their uncosted reserves plan. The administration says saving programmes is good and robust, yet it is 18 billion short. How can they build reserves when they can't reach the gap? So before concluding, Mr Mayor, I want to remind Conservative colleagues that voting for this Labour amendment is not about agreeing with every element, every detail but it's asking the Cabinet to go back and rethink. Rethink their budget proposal, take on board key elements of the debate and the amendment, and present their changes back to us in this chamber the following week. You have a chance to vote for this Labour amendment without necessarily agreeing with absolutely everything. You have a chance to tell the Cabinet that they need to listen and they need to change direction. So let me be clear, rather than the Cabinet stealing the best ideas from Labour amendments to collude them in future years, they can, we can act now. We can get them to act now. We can get them act away from short-term thinking, away from bad decision-making, away from the financial mess, and away from the pathway to bankruptcy. So I urge every council here to vote with this amendment, because it is much needed.
Thank you, Councillor Mathers. Is that a second by Councillor Cudling? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I formally second and reserve my right. Mr Mayor, if I may, the amendment has been moved and seconded. So, just for the clarity of everybody in the room, we're now debating the amendment, which is set out on pages 6 to 11 of the Order of Business, and speeches, of course, must address the amendment. Thank you. Councillor D. Mills. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have to admit, I don't rise with a great enthusiasm to speak against this amendment, not because it's good, but because it's one of the worst amendments on budget night I've ever experienced. It really is an absolute mess of little shiny baubles which have been put together in the hope, primarily presumably, of helping Hill and the Labour Party and their dwindling numbers of 22 sticking together um, a bit more. Um, it really has not been thought through. But let's look at their track record, because we do need to give some fair consideration to the points that have been raised. Now, last year, last year, the brains of the Hill and the Labour Party motion, which they were suggesting, was that they wanted to do away with the council tax discount and charge everyone that got that, in effect, a double council tax. Now, they seem to have retracted from that position because they realised how bad it is. And may I suggest, Mr Mayor, that probably in a few months' time, and maybe even a few weeks, they will look at some of the things they put forward tonight and realise how bad they are as well. But let us actually concentrate not so much on what they Councilor are... Councillor Mills, can I stop for a second? Councillor Gardner, we don't need declaration from you at the back, please, if you could quiet. So we have a very quiet, it's a budget debate at council meeting. So please. Thank you. Can you continue, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to pick up on three specific things that they've talked about a lot in this council chamber in the last 12 to 18 months and how their budget amendment is delinquent on these particular aspects. We heard them talk about the concerns of digital exclusion and the inability of a number of residents to actually make an involvement with what goes on within the council. So, what they're going to do? They want to put Hindon people digitally to make it, therefore, uh, you know, lots of residents who, who rely on it through the door have been unable to get it. As, as a good leader of this, ex-leader of this council, Sir Ray Puddyfoot would say, you couldn't make it up. But I also want to turn to the fact that they've talked a lot in the past about the early years nurseries. Now, I've looked through this. I looked through it twice in case I missed it. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Where is the capital investment that they were screaming about at council meetings? Where is the revenue investment to keep the early years nurseries going? There is nothing. They've gone silent on it. What joined up thinking is that, Councillor Mavers? Where is Hillenden Labour Party's overall thinking on this? I think it just demonstrates, Mr Mayor, this is a put together, a last minute amendment and it is not well thought out. Councillor O'Brien, I think you can take us from that, that they are endorsing your strategy that you have put forward and progressing. The other one, which we've been talking about fairly recently, and I know my colleague is going to touch upon it, is the Uxbridge Library. Again, where is the capital proposal to keep the library open, other than knowing that the report said that it is failing disabled people? Councillor Mills, time is up, please. Did I get yeah. my extra time? I got interrupted. Please sit down. Just to clarify, Councillor Mills, when you got interrupted, the clock was stopped. I think that's why I'm here to chair the meeting to let people know what's going on here. Um, I don't need dictation from any one of you. It's my job, and I'm doing it. Thank you. Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I thought I was in charge of recycling in Hillingdon, but I do congratulate Councillor Mabers on recycling his usual Hillingdon is broke council speech. This is Hillingdon, it's not Slough, it's not Birmingham. The amendment is a usual mix of upfront increases in staffing with half-costed savings to follow, and that is a sure way to financial disaster. He professes to have great concern for the environment, and I thought he was genuinely serious. 
but I note he wishes to have half-empty diesel waste trucks crossing the borough even if there is nothing for them to collect. I leave you to draw your own conclusions. I will turn um, to housing. He is proposing licensing schemes um, in both HMO and landlords. We have indeed been reviewing proposals in this area and when we have properly costed proposals, they will appear through the ZBB programme. What I will tell you now is the staff expenditure that is being quoted in the Labour Amendment is wrong, it is too low, and the assumption that you will cover your costs in year one is at best naive, and I'll leave it at that. You will need substantially more staff and they will not be cost neutral. Therefore, it does not add up as a budget. I was somewhat confused by the HRA proposals, which seem to be talking about going up by 100 units, and depending on whether you, which bit you read, it's one year or two years, but never mind. But if I take the table they produce, they're actually going up by 40 units in 25-26 and 40 in 26-27. I make that 80 when I add up, but never mind. <laughs> Given that we are proposing to increase... Um, to acquire 300 extra units in this year, this year, not next year or some other year, I would therefore, I'm delighted Labour wished to follow our lead, but it's somewhat modest in its ambition. He has a proposal in here um, to spend 350,000 on the repairs budget and increasing in later years. Miraculously, it delivers a half a million pound saving and 400,000 in a bid saving best part of a million pounds. A little education, the actual budget you want to look at is not the repairs budget, it is the planned maintenance budget. And the substantial planned maintenance budgets we have in this budget and going forward is what will reduce the demand on our repairs service going forward. Turning to the, the last item, I have heard over many weeks their passionate support um, for not relocating the Uxbridge Library and therefore not realising the some 400,000 revenue saving that was in the recent Cabinet report and will certainly come through in future years. It's Gus not Levy, been added time back is into up. any of the years. Gus Levy, I need to stop you. Thank you. Thank I you. cannot support. <laughs> Gus Bianco. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll do my best to be in the three minutes. Mr Mayor, I rise to speak. You will not be surprised to know against the Labour Amendment table tonight, and I'm particularly keen to touch on the rather strange general fund capital budget proposals that they have added. It seems odd to me, and no doubt the majority of members here, that the two main planks of this amendment relate to capital expenditure, relating to capital expenditure are to build a new tennis pavilion and let a cafe. As is so often the case with Labour budget amendments, they raise items that this administration is already moving forward with, and will then later claim falsely that we have stolen their ideas. Uh, either that or they come forward with ideas that no one in their right mind will contemplate. Tonight, they have achieved both. The former cow buyer cafe, which incidentally is in Ryslip. What, honestly, do they think they're going to win a seat in Ryslip? Uh, has been on our radar for some time. It sits in the middle of one of our most significant heritage sites and forms an important part of our ongoing strategy for the future success of the Manor Farm complex. I'm sure that when we move forward to let it, we'll do so without having to invest £150,000. The second proposal is even more baffling. Since when have the Labour Party been keen proponents of the elite sport of tennis? As most of you will know, there are already a number of well-established tennis clubs in the borough, and we provide courts in many of our parks. We don't need to build a pavilion in the green belt just to let some of our existing courts. This already happens without the need to provide a new building and certainly again without the need to spend money that can be better spent elsewhere. However, what is really surprising is not what is in the Labour Amendment but rather what they have left out. Throughout the last year they have criticised us on numerous occasions about our actions and spending plans and now here at budget setting the perfect opportunity for them to set out their stall to our residents. What have they come up with? to convince our residents to vote for them in 2026. Where, for example, is the promise to keep Uxbridge Library open? Or where it is, I should say. Bad luck, Councillor Burles. 
you clearly got no support from your front bench. They must agree with us that moving the library to the Civic Centre is the right thing to do. Mr Mayor, where are the Labour Party's real capital expenditure changes? Nowhere. Why? Because fundamentally they agree with the sensible and detailed steps we are already committed to. As we have already heard from my colleague Councillor Goddard, we are investing in many capital projects, amongst which is the investment that also Councillor Labour has touched on on housing. This council, uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, this amendment helps the residents of this borough not at all. No decent alternative to the sound financial management that this administration has provided and will continue to provide with the adoption of the main budget motion tonight. There is only one thing to do with this amendment, and that is to vote it down, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I speak in support of the amendment. As you will be aware, we are not allowed to produce our own budget, but can only offer amendments to the one before us this evening which is one with very little financial wriggle room, as it's based on the need to find savings at every level, a need to sell our assets, a need to ask our residents to pay more exactly. for getting less. <clears throat> However, using our very small window of opportunity, we aim with our amendments to make a difference, as we are the party who fully understands the financial struggles which are confronting many of our residents, our families, our children, our schools. Many of our schools, particularly our primary schools, are facing extreme financial pressure with budgets stretched almost to breaking point. So an amendment to this evening's budget which brings about government money with very little cost to the council must surely be welcomed. A bid officer will be used to extract money from government and other sources. One bid explored by a Labour council enabled its schools to benefit financially by opening up funds available from central government. Lewisham Council wrote to all eligible families offering to support their pupil premium applications. Council departments worked together to identify those who would benefit. £800 only was spent on postage. Pupil premium applications were then signed, sealed, delivered, resulted in an additional £1,200,000 pupil premium funds being unlocked. Could this good news story be repeated in Hillingdon? It could be if this administration votes for this amendment. It's a win-win situation. It would support our schools who have children on roll who currently do not receive pupil premium funding. By the way, our lack of bids was mentioned at a recent meeting of the Hillingdon Association of Residents Association that as far as bids of various sorts were concerned, Hillingdon Council was a black hole with no active bidding regime, so very different from other councils. A bid officer would change all that. Please change your mind, support the amendment as it would be potential to deliver millions to top up this rather wobbly budget. Thank you. Councillor Gawthorne. Thank you, Mr Mayor. In responding to the budget amendment, it is worth, I think, explaining to the watching public how things are supposed to work in terms of process in this regard. The budget setting process is something which takes place over a significant period of time. In fact, if you consider the MTFF, which you might liken to a long-range weather forecast with all the vagaries and uncertainty that goes with it, this is really an ongoing process which culminates each year in February for the year ahead. Our select committee system affords backbenchers the opportunity to discuss in detail not only the draft budget between December and February, but also there are opportunities throughout the year in the context of service reviews and routine service reporting to pick up issues relating to finance and to explore ideas for efficiencies and improved ways of working and service delivery. Mr Mayor, leaving aside the merits or otherwise of what's being put forward in this amendment, I'm afraid little or nothing of what's being put forward now 
with just 24 hours notice by the Labour group, has in fact been raised and discussed in select committees, which is really where this work should have started. I'd suggest that this is not even Wednesday to be reasonable to even consider supporting such an amendment. Mr Mayor, coming to the specific proposal, I'll pick up on one, which is Hillingdon People, which of course can already be accessed online. Yet we know from our adult services client base the one thing older adults and those with disabilities and their carers value almost above everything else is good, consistent, reliably delivered information and Hillington people is an important means of ensuring that people, many of whom may not be digitally enabled, receive this. The publication, which actually started life under Labour between 1994 and 1998, is nevertheless something which the Labour groups struggle with and have done throughout their years in opposition, with regular attempts to thwart and undermine the now tried and trusted formula of frequent deliveries. What could it be that so irks the Labour group about Indian people? Could it be, I wonder, something to do with the upbeat and positive content and narrative which, as an opposition group, they cannot influence? Mr Mayor, for any opposition party to be taken seriously, its membership on select committees really must be rolling up their sleeves, digging into the detail, putting in a shift and over time working up ideas which might form the basis for a plausible alternative. Mr Mayor, as it is, this amendment is no more than last minute window dressing and virtue signalling, a hollow attempt to conceal their own lack of application to process and their own threadbare prospectus. It simply does not stand up to scrutiny. I oppose the amendment. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I support this Labour amendment as nobody in this chamber can deny we are in a housing crisis. The panic house spying by the Conservatives speaks volumes of their desperation in this budget, of which we are only allowed to amend. Unlike the Conservatives, Labour's amendment shows that we will not abandon Hillington Council's 100 council house building target in a few years' time. Our amendment shows how you can afford to build more council housing in the medium term. The Labour amendment shows that foresight is better than hindsight. Let me explain. Had the Conservatives built in the school places required with the anticipated high needs demand, they wouldn't need to sell off £16 million of assets to cover the overspend, and it's still not balanced. Had this Conservative administration built in social housing on all new developments across the borough, rather than accepting financial settlements, and had they also built the net 100 council homes, we would not be panic buying in at inflated market rates, overspending in our housing budgets and exhausting our HRA. We need this amendment because the Conservative administration have broken the council's reserves, broken the council's re revenue budget and broken the designated school grant budget. And now they are breaking the housing revenue account budget. What a grand slam of broken budgets for their trophy cabinet. They should be ashamed. This amendment isn't just about house numbers, it's about residents being able to build, make a home in our borough. There is an increased trend of people not being able to afford a house or afford rent. Whilst we cannot bring in a rent cap, we can abolish some of the worst living standards in our borough. This amendment includes a licensed landlord scheme, a regulatory officer for HMOs and proper investment in maintaining our council housing stock. <coughs> By not voting for this amendment, you are denying our residents across the borough with the opportunity of a decent home. How can you not vote for this amendment? Councillor Curling. Uh, just before Councillor Curling speaks, may I remind members Councillor Curling is speaking as the seconder of the amendment, therefore has unlimited speaking time. If I could just explain, Councillor Goddard, you moved the original motion, so you have a right to reply at the end of the debate on the amendment, just before Councillor Mathers exercises exercise his right to reply. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have great pleasure in seconding the Labour amendment to the Administration's budget. And firstly, I would like to place on record my thanks to the finance team for all their hard work and assistance. Uh, 
with uh, assist, uh, sorry, I'll read that again. Firstly, I'd like to place on record my thanks to the finance team for all their hard work in assisting us, the opposition, uh, the opposition with our budget amendment. Hillingdon is very lucky to have some excellent and dedicated officers. I would also like to thank Councillor Mathers for his sterling work in putting together our amendment and focusing our minds on some difficult decisions that need facing now as an opposition group and in the future as an administration. It is undeniable that the budget setting is getting more and more challenging, not just for this council, but for all councils, because of the savage cuts by the Conservative government. However, poor decision-making by con Conservative administrations here in Hillingdon has only exacerbated the problems. Some of the bad decisions of the past, like some of the costly pre-election handouts and big vanity projects, are now biting us in the backside, together with the lack of ambition and lack of imagination coming from the current administration shows that locally, as well as nationally, the Conservatives are frankly bankrupt of ideas, and through their bad decisions, they are leading both the country and the council to financial ruin. So when it comes to the Labour amendment, it's doubly difficult to make some sense out of the chaos, because obviously we would not be starting from here. A Labour, a Labour administration in Hillingdon would take a much more pragmatic approach, embedding the council within the community rather than dictating to it. And we'd also have the imagination to seek out innovation. We would also make different decisions which would be focused on building a better borough. As we can only make amendments to the budget, we cannot try to make certain parts of, we can only try to make certain parts of it less harmful to our residents rather than rewrite the whole budget. However, that does not mean that we give our tacit approval to anything we have not amended. The Labour amendment demonstrates that even with such a poor budget, we can still offer up some suggestions to make it just a little bit better. Our proposed digital disaster reserve would help ensure that the digital transformation has a buffer to correct some of the administration's previous poor decisions and assist in reversing the computer says no mentality. We are also focused on the conservative generated cost of living crisis with some realistic proposals in our local housing support fund to help our residents who are suffering as a result of consistent conservative failure. Truly affordable social housing is also a great focus of ours and our amendment will allow for more council homes to be built and for the private rented sector to be more tenant focused with a landlord licensing scheme. We will also invest in housing repairs so that council tenants receive the service that they deserve. We're also aware of the risky position that the Conservative administration have put us in by having a general balance reserve of less than the recommended threshold. A reserve that is second or third lowest in the whole of London. So you see, Mr Mayor, with a little bit of imagination and some joined up thinking, the budget, even a poor budget like this, can be made better for our residents and also contribute more to the general reserves. Mr Mayor, we in the Labour Group believe in taking pride in our local, area, uh, local areas and we stand by our commitments. We therefore give the Conservative Administration the option to ensure that there is an alternative to the huge cuts to the street, street cleansing service. Mr Mayor, when we say that we are committed to free weekly collection of bins, including garden waste, we mean it. Just seven months ago, during the July full council meeting, the Labour group was accused by Councillor Douglas Mills of deliberately missing out garden waste in our motion. He went on to say that the Conservatives, and I quote, absolutely guarantee free weekly waste collections and that green waste is a vital piece of that service. Yes. Councillor Lavery also stated that the Conservatives would continue to provide a free weekly collection service for all types of waste. So, Mr Mayor, whilst Douglas Mills, uh, Councillor Douglas Mills and Councillor Lavery made uh, grand political statements about what happens in Camden, 
they also made cast iron guarantees that now, just seven months later, they're reneging on by making the greenway service fortnightly in the winter. When there's copious amounts of leaves, cuttings and general winter garden waste to dispose of. This is the thin end of the wedge. Fortnightly in the winter is just the first step. So what's next? More fortnightly collections to come? Or maybe a charge here and there? We obviously can't believe the guarantees given by Councillor Douglas Mills and Councillor Lavery, but every councillor in this chamber now has the opportunity to vote for the Labour amendment that maintains free, year-round, weekly collection of garden waste that Councillor Mills rightly said is a vital piece of the service. Mr Mayor, I strongly urge all councillors cross-party to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other speakers, I would like to go to Councillor Goodhart. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and it will come as no surprise that I speak in opposition to this amendment. Once again this year, the Labour Group is proposing an amendment which offers up a series of minor tweaks and changes to our core budget proposals. It must be noted that most of the amendment proposals represent ideas which have already been discussed between officers and cabinet members and have not featured in our budget, either because they are of insufficient individual size to merit individual disclosure, or because they require further work, or because we disagree with them. From our familiarity with many of the items listed here, what is very clear is that Labour's additional savings proposals are woefully inadequate in their evaluation, and therefore their prospects for successful delivery are poor, to say the least. Hence, the reality is that Labour's amendment, in truth, is little more than yet another round of needless spending increases. The earmark reserves repurposing outlined here has no meaningful substance. It is nothing more than an exercise in cosmetic presentation. But finally, let me share with you something that I feel is rather uh, revealing. If one takes a look at this table, table one, of which deals with the general fund changes. And you may say that it's taken a sad accountant to point this out. But, Mr Mayor, it simply does not add up. <laughs> Savings proposals here do not total £1,041,000, but actually add up to £295,000. And it gets even a bit more confusing, because if you turn to paragraph 16, the narrative supports this table, it there cites the savings as £292,000. So which is it? A million and 41? 295? 292? I don't know. Furthermore, even if you try to correct this error, the grand total at the foot of the page, which is shown as £145,751,000, actually adds up to £145,746,000. The level of incompetence is breathtaking and dangerous. The residents of the London Borough of Hillingdon can breathe a sigh of relief that Labour is not setting this budget. Yeah. I oppose the amendment. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Councillor Mayors. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It is uh, encouraging to have more comments from the Conservative side than normal. Uh, even if they feel it was short notice. I will remind them that we cannot write an amendment in full until Cabinet have approved the budget, and we have given this amendment in plenty of time. This amendment does raise concerns that we have about the budget, and not just us, but many. It is a high-risk budget in terms of returns, uh, reserves, and it needs reserves building, and this amendment provides that. Our residents would like the support of the Council for the services they have, they would like support in a cost of living crisis of which we have provided uh, modest, it would love to be more, but we recognise the challenges, a chance for them to get support if in financial difficulty. It provides the free weekly bin collections, which I'm sure we were in agreement on not so long ago. It provides an opportunity to increase the living standards for tenants in this whole borough, whether privately renting or council tenants. 
It builds the homes we need. There was a housing crisis long before uh, the asylum seekers needed housing, and yet the Conservative Council was slow to respond. It provides a lot, but more importantly, it helps to contribute in a way which we hope will be helpful. When the blood is pouring out of the arm, a sticking plaster cannot stop the flow. We have tried our best, and these amendments do make a difference, but we cannot stem the tide, which is the financial failure the Conservative administration are displaying. I would encourage all to reconsider those who aren't voting with um, and would support this amendment. We are going to voting now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members will recall from the agenda that regulations require all votes uh, taken on the budget, including votes on amendment, have to be recorded votes. So I will, uh, in the normal way, call out each member's name in alphabetical order and please indicate if you're voting for the amendment as set out on pages 6 to 11, against the amendment or abstaining. Councillor Abbey. For the amendment. Councillor Banerjee. Yes. Councillor Bassett. Yes. Councillor Bennett. Councillor Batt, yes. Councillor Bianco, yes. Councillor Bridges, yes. Councillor Burles, yes. Councillor Burrows, yes. Councillor Rita Chamdell, yes. Councillor Chubidar, yes. Councillor Cawthorn, yes. Councillor Curling, yes. Councillor Davies, yes. Councillor Dennis, yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Farley, yes. Councillor Gardner, yes. Councillor Gaelic, yes. Councillor Garg, yes. Councillor Gill, Councillor Goddard, Against. Councillor Gohill, yes. Councillor Hager, yes. Councillor Higgins, yes. Councillor Islam, Four. Councillor Judge, Four. Councillor Kaur, Four. Councillor Lakmana, Councillor Lavery, Against. Councillor Lewis, Against. Councillor Makwana, yes. Councillor Mand, Four. Councillor Mathers, Four. Councillor D. Mills, Against. Councillor R. Mills, Against. Councillor Money, Four. Councillor Nelson, Councillor Nelson West, Councillor O'Brien, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Punja, Councillor Riley, Councillor Sansapuri, Councillor Singh, Councillor Smallwood, Councillor Sweeting, Councillor Tuckwell, Madam Deputy Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That amendment is lost by 28 votes to 22. We now return to the debate on the original. Uh, motion to which members can indicate if they wish to speak. Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This administration <laughs> continues to deliver on rising school standards, with 91% of our schools being rated good or better by Ofsted. This is above the national average, and 93% of early year settings remain good or better, which is above the London average. This includes outcomes for vulnerable learners, such as children who are looked after, and this budget will continue to help those most in need in achieving their age-related expectations. We know that birth rates are declining to a degree whereby schools have steadily started to reduce their pan. In contrast, this allows the admissions team to stay on track to offer every Hillingdon child that applied on time a school place on National Offer Day for both primary and secondary transition. In December 2023, Hillingdon received an outstanding Ofsted following its local authorities' inspection for its children's services. In the long term, the outstanding work officers are currently actively engaging in with preventative and early intervention measures will, in essence, start to stem the flow to the front door. Prevention is better than cure. Hillingdon has seen a growth of 100% in special educational needs provision since 2014, and last year, the increase in EHCPs rose by 14%. Hillingdon continues to provide children with the best start in life, with high-quality learning environments, and with this administration's strong financial management, we continue to invest in our schools through our capital programme. This council is delivering on SEN specialist provision. Two settings, as well as the newly designed assessment centre, have now been handed over to the respective schools and the third will come on board after the Easter break. In addition, Meadow School's expansion at Harefield is moving forwards and we will break ground this week. In addition, we have further special schools provisions coming, working its way through the pipeline. 
Hillingdon now boasts of two state-of-the-art family hubs, open in Uxbridge and Hayes, which bring services together to improve access between families, professionals, services and providers, putting relationships at the heart of family support, fundamentally offering children, young people and fa some families preventative early help. We now look towards rollout in the north of the borough. Adult education continues to, continues to run hundreds of courses, encouraging lifelong learning. Fees and charges continue to remain amongst the lowest in London for my areas. Some of our services are non-existent outside of Hillingdon. Fees have increased by modest 5% across my service area, and it remains a priority that this administration continues to seek cost-neutral balances for non-statutory services due to the exponential rise in cost of statutory services. Mr Mayor, I support this budget for our residents, children, young people and families of this borough. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Social care continues to face long-standing financial pressures, growing demand for adult social care placements and a precarious, narrow provider market. My portfolio of health and social care is inextricably linked. We cannot and must not look at one without the other. In order to deliver our joint health and wellbeing strategy and enable our residents to live independently as long as possible, we must strive to be innovative and work with our partners to deliver better outcomes for our residents. This budget will enable Hillingdon Council to continue with our early intervention approach, working to assist independent, healthy living for as long as possible. An effective triage approach is essential, and with the support of a digital front door, and the automating of initial contact with prospective service users, it is expected that savings will be made. We will, if so, I beg your pardon, Mr Mayor, investment in new diagnostic equipment as part of our new digital investment is on track to reduce care costs by 150k in 24-25. We will review our telecare line to ensure residents have current available technology suited to their individual needs and care plans. The contribution to the Better Care Fund pooled budget with health colleagues will continue to support our most vulnerable residents. The reablement services and our joint working with Hillingdon Hospital enables us to have the best discharge record in North West London. The budget will continue to enable our dementia support services, our over 65 exercise classes to improve overall fitness. Unlike other councils, we can look to the future and develop new streamlined methods of approach to delivering social care. This could not be possible without si sound financial management, nor without the dedication and willingness of offers, officers, particularly Sandra Taylor and her team, to adapt to change. I support this budget. Thank you. Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I am very pleased this evening to add my support to what is no, another well-crafted budget. I also pay tribute to Councillor Goddard for continuing the principle that this Conservative administration has maintained and delivered for over two decades. Delivering a well-crafted and balanced budget in the face of a global economic challenges underpins the core principle of sound financial management that continues to put our residents first. I also pay tribute to our officer teams and their hard work and dedication for all of the work that they do in facing the economic challenges whilst maintaining core services our residents quite rightly expect. Mr Mayor, by contrast, we've heard tonight through the opposition amendment what a disaster Labour would be for the finances of Hillingdon. Their budget simply doesn't add up and shows a worrying lack of financial understanding. Residents watching the debate this evening will clearly see what's been proposed by the Hillingdon Labour Group is hollow, empty and without substance. Time and time again, we see how when, Labor, the part, when the Labour Party have control of anything, it is a disaster, whether it's Birmingham, Nottingham, Wales or much closer to home here in London, where we've seen the Mayor of London increase council tax by an eye-watering 71% since 2016. And what do Hillingdon and London taxpayers get in return for that? 
failure upon failure. ULEZ expansion imposed on hard-working families in outer London and businesses. Crime up on all metrics. Failure to recruit police officers despite significant government bailouts. Housing targets missed. Bus routes decimated. Londoners continually ignored and transport chaos such as continuing strikes and what we all know is the central line debacle. Hillingdon Conservatives have a proven track record of delivery for our residents for over two decades and this budget maintains this principle that protects the core services that our residents respect and cherish. Mr Mayor, many MP colleagues of mine from across the UK often compliment me on how well Conservative Hillingdon is run. These compliments underpin the principle of sound financial management that puts our residents first. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lowry. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, before I start, my thanks to officers across the place directorate for their positive engagement in this year's budget setting process. I will give a few highlights having already commented on a number of matters in response to the opposition amendment. I am delighted to say we will continue our successful playground refurb refurbishment project in green spaces and I am delighted to announce tonight the Borough Diamond Jubilee Park Scheme which will bring, bring improvements this year to Bessonby, Churchfield Gardens, Fastenage, The Close and Barra Hall. Turning to our libraries, we remain committed to 16 libraries and will begin work hopefully later this year on a full refurbishment at Northwood Hills and subject to planning the transfer of the Uxbridge Library to this site. We are currently sourcing a temporary library for Northwood following the closure of the permanent premises due to structural defect and we will come forward with proposals for a new permanent library in Northwood. The waste and recycling team has been increased um, to promote greater food waste to our residents and I have had the pleasure of being out with them and they are very keen, enthusiastic and successful at door knocking. We will also continue to roll out uh, food waste participation across our housing stock and working um, with private flat owners. We will also begin work on remodelling of the New Year's Green Lane civic community site to increase reuse and recycling. But if I could encourage everyone to do one thing, and that is recycle your food waste. I have already talked extensively about housing, but I do wish to record my thanks to Dan Kennedy and the team for the work that they are putting into sourcing extra housing units now for our residents. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Levy, can you put the mic off? Thank you. Councillor Nelson. Councillor Nelson, if you stop talking to each other, then you would know that's your turn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This budget shows that the Conservative administration continues the proven track record of cutting, cutting, cutting frontline services. 11 street cleaners will be going. Bookshelf space in Oxbridge Library going. Community buildings going. Rural tea room, which support our residents with disability, gone. Support for the bowls club, gone. Our community safety team, all but gone. Local children's center across the borough, gone. Youth centers barely running, or gone. Harlington Library, gone. And this on top of most libraries are shut at lunchtime. This year's budget showed that the Conservative administration have abundant free weekly garden waste collection, abandoned their 100 council housing target, <coughs> abandoned the elderly in shelter housing, Abundant our high streets, abundant Heathrow villages. This budget follows on from last year's 30 per cent hike in fees and charges, and before the 5 per cent on parking fees, on hiring fees, 
on burial fees, on residence permit, and more. In a continued cost of living crisis caused by the conservative. Why are they doing this? Because they no longer can afford to run our services because of their bad management. It begs belief that this council public asset will all be sold off to cover their inefficiency at balancing the book. There will soon be no more of the family silver left to sell off under this conservative council. What will they do then? Just like their conservative government, they have maxed out on our country credit card, and in the next five years, we'll be heading towards default and ultimately bankruptcy. Our residents are so fed up with the basic service expected that is not being given out by this council. As they have cut so many staff, there is no one left to do the job. And our residents are saying to us, why are we paying our council tax if this council is not providing the service? Mr. Mayor, this budget is not fit for purpose. Thank you. Councillor Munn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The GB News report about Hillingdon Conservatives' lack of financial stability is amplified in this budget. You may not have read it in Hillingdon People, but Hillingdon hit the headlines in the Telegraph on 7th of December 2023, as they reported that our borough was voted the most unhappiest place to live in the Right Moves Happy at Home Index. How has the borough that used to have thriving high streets, vibrant art sector, active youth centers, clean roads, free parking permits, maintained bowls greens, libraries open at lunch, and a prominent voluntary sector decline to such a soiled reputation. A few months later, there we are again in the Telegraph, named and shamed on the 12th of February 2024 as the most NIMBY council. You can tell Boris is no longer in Hillingdon. Hillingdon conservatives seem to have lost their friends in high places. If they still had them, maybe they would have been motivated to lobby for more funding from their government. Mr. Mayor, where is the future for the next generation in this budget? When will there be hope for those struggling in our borough? Who will be supporting our older population as we ultimately journey towards bankruptcy? I have asked you how. I have asked you where. I have asked you when, and I have asked you who. So now let me tell you why this budget is not fit for purpose. Fees and charges up, reserves down, financial risk up, resident satisfaction down. Mr. Mayor, this budget is so bad that I ask myself, how are they going to afford their usual electioneering in two years' time? We've all seen it resurface roads on polling day, and at this time, a 0.9% reduction in council tax. This budget is as cynical as Hillingdon Conservatives electioneering, and like them, not fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gardner, you can also remain seated while speaking. Um, Mr. Mayor, as a few of you may know, I've been on this council for almost 30 years, but not as long as councillors Bianco, Mills Senior and Cawthorn. And like them, I've listened to far too many budget setting meetings to remember them all in detail. But this Hillington Conservative budget is the worst ever. It's a rear covering exercise because those over there know that their government has basically shafted them. To put it mildly, it's just a crock, and you can use whatever word you like, because I'm not allowed to swear. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sweeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
There are many questions on this budget. Is it sound? No. Is it resilient? No. Is it strong? No. Does it have a black financial hole at its heart? Yes. Is it only balanced by selling family silver? Yes. Is it based on the government continuing with the override, which currently separates our 26 million high needs debt from our now inadequate 26 million in reserves? Yes. Where is my evidence for making these assertions? Well, it's all for everybody to see in the last cabinet report. So let's audit it, shall we? Savings from the current financial year of some 5 million plus not delivered and with potential problems. Page 73, table 2. Earmark reserves of 20 million reduced by some 47%, leaving just 10 million. Page 70, paragraph 8. Sale of 75 million of council's assets to pay for services. Page 7, paragraph 7. Extra costs of over 4 million emerging in just one month. Page 73, paragraph 22. General balance is not high enough with 32 million, the minimum requirement, which we currently do not have. Page 11, paragraph 20. Then there is the large rogue elephant in the room, our high needs deficit of 26 million 487,000, up by just under 5 million from last year. Did the Council undertake a risk assessment when its government placed on it its extra duties in 2014? No, as this administration's view was that it was not its problem to fund but the government's. So we sat on our hands and allowed the deficit to grow to 30 million plus, leading us to bail out a safety valve agreement which only councils with the highest deficit have needed to use. If the government calls in the override, we would be in, quote, material financial risk, as page five, paragraph three states, as this council would need to clear its debts of just over 26 million by using its reserves of 26 million. What a perfectly balanced budget that would be. <laughs> One last point. Budget speeches tonight have crowed, Hillingdon does it better. So let's com compare ourselves to Illy Ealing's high needs, which has sought no bailout from government, no safety valve, no significant high needs deficit. So there you have it. A budget, budget based on sand, shifting sand, a budget not fit for purpose. And by the way, just one point, I thought the Harefield project has problems because in one of the reports, it said it was going back to planning. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe we can uh, confirm that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Core. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I genuinely envy the enthusiasm with which our friends at the administration dish out their abject financial mess with a generous dressing of verbose eloquence. But one only needs to start a little folk of common sense, and voila, truth oozes out faster than you can say, oops. Hillingdon is one of the councils with lowest reserves in London. And gosh, they have audacity to pretend all is well. The administration is using significant amounts of its woefully inadequate earmarks reserves each year. In a year or so, there will be no more earmarks reserves left. What will they do then? Still snigger and mock? They have no plan on how they will put aside 1.5 million each year for reserves when it has a 51 million pound gap to fill in the next five years and only 33 million pounds of identified savings. Oh, I know. And as the cabinet member conceded, they will sell the family silver. They plan to sell 75 million worth of assets in the borough over the coming five years. While I and Council Tuckville are really passionate and sensitive about heritage assets, that might not be enough to save our precious heritage between the two of us. Only I will be voting to save these and his colleagues would be signing off the sale deeds. The speed at which this administration is planning and plotting to put into disuse the assets on pretext of access of requirements, decarbonizing, health and safety, structural damage, 
we'll have nothing left to pass on to the next generation. This is not all. Where is the 60 million pounds worth of investment promised only two short years ago towards net zero and civic center transformation? All slashed down and scaled down by a whopping 20 million pounds. So please stop blowing your trumpet over a budget which is all about hiking council tax and nearly a thousand of other fees and charges at the time when people are struggling to put food on the table. And stop pretending that all is hunky-dory with our frontline services, which despite the officers doing their utmost, are left threadbare and wanting. No wonder Hillingdon is one of the unhappiest places to live. So if this budget is anything, it is just shambolic with a capital S, not fit for purpose. If no other speakers, Councillor Edwards, the leader. Uh, before Councillor Edwards speaks, can I just remind members that he's speaking as the seconder to the original motion and therefore has unlimited speaking time. <laughs> Councillor Hanscury, I've got you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I proudly and with absolute confidence second this excellent budget. Yeah. The detail of which has been very well explained by Councillor Goddard. The debate has shown the difference in approach between the Conservative sound financial management and Labour's costly bauble chasing and tinkering around the edges. As leader, it is my responsibility to ensure that we look beyond the next year. And whilst none of us can predict the future, what we can do and what underpins our sound financial management is an assessment of the possible outcomes and the risk attached to each so that we can develop strategies and budgets that ensure the future financial stability of this council. Let us be in no doubt that the consequences for residents of an authority that has had to issue a section 114 notice are far greater than having savings being secured at the earliest opportunity, thereby avoiding that notice. Earlier this week, the residents of Birmingham learned that their council tax will rise by 21% over the next two years, as well as suffering £300 million cuts in services and the sale, forced sale, of £700 million in assets. The financial situation facing all local authorities is particularly challenging at this time. Only two weeks ago, the Labour chaired cross-parliamentary committee on levelling up housing and communities published their report that concluded, amongst other things, that local authorities have seen significant reductions in their spending power, coincide with increasing demand for their services and inflationary pressures exceeding those in the wider economy. Recent funding settlements, they said, while increasing in cash terms, have not kept pace with these pressures, leading to a downward spiral. Over the last decade and more, successive governments have altered the way local government in England is funded. The overall effect has been to reduce the amount of funding from government and to increase councils' reliance on locally generated revenue, council tax and commercial income. A decade ago, 30% of our spending power was from government grants. In the next financial year, 24-25, it is down to 23%. This policy of making local governments more self-sufficient has encouraged many councils to offset funding reductions by generating speculative commercial income, a temptation that this Conservative administration has resisted and will continue to resist. Let us not forget that the Labour Group proposed such a venture in their 2019-2020 in budget amendment by setting up an energy supply company, which they forecast would cost only £100,000 a year. The re reality would have been starkly different, with Bristol City Council having closed their energy company in 2021, <coughs> having incurred total losses of about £46 million and Nottingham Council doing the same, having up, run up losses of £34.4 million. Looking at demand pressures for statutory services, adult and children's social care continues to be the largest single area of core funded expenditure for local authorities, 
and it is expected to account for 57% of our spending next year. Homelessness is a growing issue and cost to local authorities, with the number of households nationally who are homeless and living in temporary accommodation reported in September 2023 to be at the highest since records began. London boroughs are forecasting to overspend more than £90 million on temporary accommodation this year. Hillingdon has not been immune to these pressures and tackling homelessness has been one of the main drivers of our use of earmarked reserves in 2023-24 and it remains a concern looking forwards. The increase in demand for and cost of providing statutory services, if unchanged, will squeeze our ability to provide the universal services that residents expect and for which the majority pay their council tax to receive. Our budget provides an alternative to waiting for additional government funding that in all probability will not arise. We must cut our cloth according to our income and our commitments, and Councillor Goddard has spoken in some detail about our £33.4 million saving programme over the life of the MTFF. Our savings and transformation programme and zero-based budgeting approach will continue to drive change within the Council as well as change to service provision. This is in marked contrast with the Labour Group who each year propose to reverse a proportion of the savings decisions that we have made or propose to recruit yet more staff rather than changing the priorities and working practices of existing staff. When, challenged, when challenging our savings proposals, it is not untypical of the opposition to make much noise about our proposal, but then not to back up their words by providing the necessary funding within their budget amendments. It is clear that Labour has no strategic plan. The uh, Labour amendment evidences, whilst it may be council, carefully costed, Councillor Mathers, a complete lack of attention to detail and an ability to do basic sums, which I would have thought was a prerequisite of sound financial management. Their largesse is often funded by yet more drawing down on reserves, but not always. As Councillor Mells pointed out, last year's spending spree was to be funded by doubling the increase in council tax that year for residents over 70, a most callous attack on our elderly residents. Yeah. This administration understands that, all things being equal, the more staff it employs, the more income it needs to raise from residents from council taxes or fees and charges. This is near, clearly not the understanding of the Labour group. Their proposal to create a bid writing team of two members of staff is an example of unnecessary growth and waste of expenditure. Rather than cre creating a dedicated team, this administration requires all senior managers to seek additional funding, and our approach has secured not the £60,000 of additional funding per year that Labour is aiming for, but 188, not 1,000, not 100,000, but 188 million pounds of additional grants over the life of the MTFF without an additional penny being spent on staff. I agree with Councillor Curling that under La Labour administration they would not be starting from here with the sound financial platform provided by the Conservatives. Had we agreed in 2022 to their amendment of the, the budget for 2022-23 to use £3 million from general balances to fund their election giveaway budget, we would now be perilously close to the minimum levels of reserves required. It would have also required a further cut in expenditure in the coming years to head off the service of a Section 114 notice and would have prevented the rebuilding of our reserves over the next four years. Hillingdon Conservatives have a different approach and our budget provides the means by which we will become smaller, simpler and smarter. Being smaller means further rationalisation of our management structure, particularly the most senior tiers. This is in addition to the £1 million already achieved from a reduction in senior management. 
It also means resisting the upward growth in staffing that Labour continually advocate for, reprioritising the work of existing staff and changing working practices, systems and processes so that we can achieve more with less. And being smaller also means operating from fewer buildings, saving on property overheads, with surplus capacity being made available for use by partners or commercially let. Those assets that are beyond their useful life will be disposed of to reinvest in our retained buildings, future-proofing them for many years to come. Simpler means organising ourselves from a resident's perspective, not according to our own needs, so that it becomes far easier for residents to obtain the information, help or service that they need. Making things simpler for residents is greatly helped by the co-location of complementary services. Our family hubs are an example and they are moving from strength to strength as family support services are brought together within a neighbourhood and are delivered under integrated leadership. Co-location makes integration of services easier, which in turn reveals duplication and waste, allowing for further efficiency gains to be realised and service improvements to be made. Our £10 million investment in digital transformation will help us to become smarter, not only by harnessing the power and benefits of automation and artificial intelligence, but also by improving our data management. Being smarter will allow us to redeploy staff from back office processing to front office resident contact and service, driving up further resident satisfaction with the council. Being smarter means unlocking new potential in demand management and early in intervention, using our data better to anticipate the needs of residents, particularly those at risk of becoming more dependent upon council services. Our budget also shows our ambition to invest, to improve, to grow. The capital programme set out the range of investments and improvement we will be making over the MTF period, and which Councillor Goddard has fully spoken about. I just wish to draw a few matters to attention for the benefit of residents. Our 50% increase in the Chrysalid Fund that will further improve our parks and open spaces. More than a third increase in our highways programme, with a greater proportion being spent on impro improving our pavements. £88 million investment in temporary accommodation to re reduce the cost of providing this necessary support to our homeless residents and £37.2 million to step up improvement to the condition of our housing stock, prioritising energy efficiency to reduce fuel poverty and to tackle tramp and mould. Our budget evidences our commitment to remain a low-tax authority. As Councillor Goddard mentioned in his speech, our fees and charges, whilst having to be increased by the prevailing rate of inflation, will continue to be amongst the lowest in outer London. And while it has been necessary to increase council tax, including social care preset, by £66 per year, this is in comparison with an average increase of £76 across our three immediate neighbouring London boroughs and the reported national average increase of £103. It is clear that residents are better off under Hillingdon Conservatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Mayor, this is a prudent budget that provides the investment needed to enable us to become smaller, simpler, smarter, whilst maintaining the services and investment in facilities that our residents have come to expect. It is a balanced budget that makes no cuts to frontline services and with no drawdown on reserves. It makes no assumptions about improvement in future government funding beyond that already made. It makes realistic and sensible provision for, inserts, for service inflation and demand-led growth. It maintains a safe level of unrestricted balances, providing an modest headroom of £5 million above the recommended mi minimum. And it increases our reserves each year to £45 million by 2028, which is the midpoint in the range recommended by the Director of Finance. I commend this budget to the Council and I congratulate Councillor Goddard and our yeah. Office of Finance Officer team in its contract. Thank you.
Thank you, Leader. Councillor Sanisbury. Mr. Mayor, the Conservative cannot say that the DSG deficit. Can you please just a minute? Mr. Mayor, if I could just explain. When the Mayor called upon you, there were no other speakers indicated. Since you've been speaking, Councillor Sanspuri and Councillor Punja have indicated. It's only Councillor Goddard that gets the final right to reply. So there were no other speakers when he called on you today. You may continue, please. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, the Conservative cannot say that DGS deficit is all down to their government. We told them in the budget amendment five years ago that deficit was going to be a problem and they needed to do something about it. However, one bailout later, two safety wall negotiation later, or is that three, four million pounds a year to correct the DSG overspent by selling council buildings. Five conservative prime minister later, and here we are. With school deficit equal to our general reserves and on the pathway to bankruptcy. Mr. Mayor, I cannot vote for this budget because council isn't listening to the school forum who rejected their money grabs. I cannot vote for this budget because, the, because it leaves an 18 million pound gap in five years' time. I cannot vote for this budget because it is not fit for purpose. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Punja, you indicated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We should all be very, very concerned under this budget. And with the Conservative Cabinet's poor performance, in decision making, this council will have one of the lowest reserves in the whole of London. How can they continue to get it so wrong? Why are their forecasts so out? And why aren't they hitting their savings targets? Costs are running out of control because of their own doing. And like ostriches, they are burying their head in the sand and now the ground is shaking. Worryingly for residents, it's a cut to resident services that is being hit the most with a whopping £17.77 million hacked out over two years with more to come. Our libraries, our waste services, our street cleaning, our community safety, and that's just to name a few. Is this council saying that all of these services were surplus to requirement, or are they telling the residents of Hillingdon we, just, we can just about switch the street lights on? And when other council leaders from all parties went to the government to call for more funding, where was the leader of our council? Why was he not fighting for the residents of Hillingdon? Maybe because he knows that Hillingdon could have avoided these problems had successive Conservative administrations, including his, made better decisions on how money was spent. After all, the council did have healthy reserves and would have seen through this period without extra <coughs> borrowing at high costs. Mr Mayor, as Hillingdon Conservatives desperately try to hit their savings target, they have produced a budget reliant on selling our precious community assets, of which only £35 million worth have been identified. Could the £13 million digital transformation be as defunct as their budget? I mean, who signs off on an IT software package without checking it has a search function, which will now cost thousands to rectify? What a waste of money. And need I mention the signing off on bankrupt builders for West Drayton Leisure Centre? <laughs> Furthermore, is it the habit of successive Conservative administrations to only act when it's too late? For example, Uxbridge Library is now deemed unsafe. £10 million spent in 2014 for 17 library refurbishments, now only 16, was assessing the safety of not part of the budget? How much is, going to, is it going to cost to now check and restore the safety of public council buildings? Where is that in this budget? Mr Mayor, Conser Hillingdon Conservatives are, are having to borrow a further £10 million as contingency for building projects while costs are spiralling out of control. Clearly, just as they refurbish in, in an unsafe manner, they budget in an unsafe manner too. This budget is identifiably high risk, unsustainable and just not fit for purpose. If no other speakers, Councillor Goodall. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and you can tell by the uh, reaction um, 
there is a consensus view that I should keep further comments to an absolute minimum, particularly as so much has been said. This budget and medium-term financial forecast provides yet further evidence of the strength and quality of Hillingdon's financial governance. Yeah, yeah. It promotes further investment in our services while shielding this authority from the tough financial environment which has engulfed others. Once again, we're delivering outstanding value to our residents yeah, yeah. while enabling us to honour our manifesto pledges. I therefore recommend this budget to the Chamber. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Now we're going to vote. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, a name vote required on the uh, re cabinet recommendations to council are set out on pages two to five of the order of business. I'll ask you in turn if you're voting for those recommendations, against them, or abstaining. Councillor Abbey. Against. Councillor Banerjee. Councillor Bassett? Yes. Councillor Bennett? Yes. Councillor Batt? Yes. Councillor Bianco? Yes. Councillor Bridges? Yes. Councillor Burles? Yes. Councillor Burrows? Yes. Councillor Rita Chamdell? Yes. Councillor Chubadar? Yes. Councillor Cawthorn? Yes. Councillor Curling? Yes. Councillor Davies? Yes. Councillor Dennis? Yes. Councillor Edwards? Yes. Councillor Farley? Yes. Councillor Gardner? Yes. Councillor Gaelic? Councillor Garg, yes. Councillor Gill, yes. Councillor Goddard, yes. Councillor Gohill, yes. Councillor Hager, yes. Councillor Higgins, yes. Councillor Islam, yes. Councillor Judge, yes. Councillor Kaur, yes. Councillor Lakmana, yes. Councillor Lavery, yes. Councillor Lewis, yes. Councillor Makwana, yes. Councillor Mand, yes. Councillor Mathers, yes. Councillor D. Mills, Councillor R. Mills, Councillor Money, yes. Councillor Nelson, yes. Councillor Nelson West, yes. Councillor O'Brien, yes. Councillor Palmer, yes. Councillor Punja, yes. Councillor Riley, yes. Councillor Sansapuri, yes. Councillor Singh, yes. Councillor Smallwood, yes. Councillor Sweeting, yes. Councillor Tuckwell, yes. Madam Deputy Mayor, yes. Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That is carried by 28 votes to 22. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the end of the meeting. I formally close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>